had nothing against these victims. Who were these people to me? They were just people. I, you know, they didn't, um, I didn't hate them. I wasn't angry against them. So what did they do it? Well, Sam did it through me. He used me. He made me go out there and do it. He, I did it for him, for blood. Welcome to another episode of Cracklin' Rosie True Crime. I'm Rosie and I'm so excited to be here. So happy you're here. Don't forget to like the video on your way out and let's just get started. In our last video, while talking about hunting humans, the alleged stabbings on Christmas Eve 1975 were brought up. So today I brought up the slide, and this is from the SOS Timeline Slideshow. This can be downloaded if you like. The link is available on the About page for this channel. I'm going to just read it for you. Alleged Stabbings, Christmas Eve 1975, Bronx. Co-op City Boulevard, unidentified Hispanic female. No police or hospital records. Struck with hunting knife, possibly did not penetrate coat. So this one's controversial because there are no hospital or police records. A lot of people feel that this may not have happened. It was mentioned, Berkowitz brought it up when being interviewed during his psychiatric evaluations. And it was mentioned in Klausner and I believe in Abramson as well. Although I believe Abramson, because there was no proof, he didn't push for this first stabbing of the unidentified Hispanic female. Michelle Foreman, 15, sophomore at Truman High School. Stab wound to the head, three to the upper body, two to the face with hunting knife. Now this one I believe most people do think happened because there was news coverage on it. There was a newspaper article and there was also mention of these in the books from David's evaluations. So the one thing that really stuck out for me was David had mentioned his experience, his initial murderous experiences with this hunting knife. He had thought like the movies, he would, you know, give a stab and the victim would bleed out, drop to the floor and, and that's it. And they would perish. But he actually said that he kept stabbing and um, Michelle was screaming and it, it was, it, he freaked out. It just didn't go to plan. Hence, I'm sure that's why he decided to be a shooter as opposed to um, a stabber. So I believe the Michelle Foreman happened and it's very possible that the unidentified Hispanic female stabbing happened as well. I don't know, I don't have proof of that, but why would he admit to it? I mean, we know he's a liar, but you know, why make up? It, it makes sense that maybe she wasn't injured and then he went along his way and came upon Michelle Foreman. So that's the co-op city stabbings. And I just wanted to read that slide for you. So some of you had some questions on it in chat of the last video. So I thought it was important for me to share. Okay, let's move on. So this letter to D from David Berkowitz is dated June 8th, 1979. Dear D, you're so funny sometimes. Really you are. What do you mean your old age is just around the corner? False teeth, gray hairs, pills, eyeglasses, a walking cane. For you, maybe in another 40 years. Heck, you're only 29 and a half. Make it 29 and three quarters now. You've got a long way to go before things like these are upon you. Judging from pictures of you, your beauty, your pep, vigor, sex appeal, and youthful mind, why, you're just a kid. 
I got letters 60 and 61 from you, plus the two magazines. I also got the 13 stamps. Thank you for all of it. D, getting back to Ted, I would like to see the book when and if it comes out. I also have questions about the victims. Do you, from your extensive investigation into the Bundy case, think that he also murdered Arliss Perry? She was the teenage girl from California who was found slain and left on top of the church altar somewhere in that state. I would also be interested in knowing about the victims, such as, were any of them true Christians? If you know any of this information, I would appreciate hearing about it. Your beliefs about the relationship between Bundy and witchcraft are most interesting. Too bad you ripped up that first letter. Seriously, I doubt if the police would have been interested in your theories. No offense, but they probably would have only branded you as a crackpot. They're more down to earth. However, I personally believe you have some good factual and perhaps very accurate information. Dr. Abramson will be visiting me on Tuesday and Wednesday, June 12th and 13th. It should be interesting. I've also enclosed a list of the books. Many of them were bestsellers. For your information, his address is Dr. David Abramson, MD, 1035 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10028. And then Berkowitz here just lists all the books by Dr. Abramson. And if you look down here, the murdering mind is there. Remember, Dr. Abramson mentioned in his book that when he went to Kings County to evaluate David upon their meeting, David knew exactly who he was, and he said that he had read The Murdering Mind. So we're just going to jump over the books and go to the next page. There we go. I now have another picture to add to my collection. The Gentile Beachcomber. Boy, that seashore looks wonderful, cool and refreshing. And that lovely mountain in the background that's topped with lush green vegetation. Fantastic. Ecstasy. Pure beauty. Have I left something out? Oh yes, you. Sorry about that. You're beautiful too. Really you are. D, hang in there. Don't give up. I know your job is a hassle and that it lacks meaning and fulfillment. Just hang in there. All my love and friendship. David. And then underneath it says David Berkowitz 81279. It also has that on the first page. Of course, we know it's June 8th that this was dated. I don't know if that was mail, but he did receive that card that we went, or he did send that card and the book to D Channel that we talked about in the first, um, in the last video rather. And uh, I don't know if that's, uh, he was marking that because this letter was sent to Abramson on that date, or it was near and around Dee's birthday. I thought her birthday was the 11th, but we'll double check that. Actually, let me just scan through. I know I have it on here. A14. This is for your birthday, so I don't know exactly. It was dated 814. I don't know if that was her exact date of birth, or if that's just when David wrote the card, but it was at around that time. So I don't, like I said, I don't know if he sent that letter off to the doctor, um, or why, but it was noted on the letter. Let's see, you can see my cursor. And then on the first page, David Berkowitz. It's a signature 81279. All right, let's carry on. A friend of the channel forwarded this article. The complexity of Berkowitz admitted killer shows conflicting views of self. So thank you for that. I just want to make mention, I have some people that love the shout outs and I also have people who prefer to remain anonymous. So. When you send me stuff, if you wouldn't mind just marking 
which is the case with you, I'd really appreciate it. I don't want to dox anybody and I don't want to embarrass anybody. So if you like the shout out, let me know shout out okay or keep it anonymous, Rosie. That would be really helpful. Now, I'm trying to obtain a full clear copy of this article and I will share it on our community tab on YouTube, which I'm loving and I hope you're enjoying too. I'm still working out the, quir the quirks with it, um, but I see that some people are appreciating the shares there because they're not on Facebook where a lot of the stuff uh, ends up. But this is the article and I'm, I'm gonna cover just a particular passage since we've had so many questions about D Channel. So this is from New York Associated Press, David R. Berkowitz writes of himself, son of Sam, a destructive monster, a modern day Judas. He thinks so highly of himself, a child of Satan, a Christian. Hmm, duality. In eight letters written during the past six months, the admitted killer sometimes sees himself as a born again Christian comforted by the Bible. But the letters, often ungrammatical, show that he lapses into depression and irrationality and threatens suicide. I am really a destructive monster who is unfit to live on this planet and breathe God's air. I don't intend to stay much longer. Berkowitz wrote a week before trying to jump from a courthouse window. The letters were obtained by the Associated Press from D Channel, a West Coast woman who calls herself a Christian counselor specializing in demonology. With agreement not to reveal her whereabouts, the real sickos are still out of prison, she said. The letters to Mrs. Channel reveal a complex David Berkowitz, and then it goes on. So I was just covering this passage today. I will probably cover the article in its entirety when I'm able to get a good legible copy for you. But we've had questions about Miss D Channel and here, you know, is it possible that she was allowed to correspond right away with David? Remember, we had the question, how right after his him being apprehended, was she able to reach him? Well, maybe because she was a counselor um, specializing in demonology, uh, you know, they allowed her to converse with him. But uh, that was just a little something I found very interesting. They talk about his suicidal tendencies and pretty much the chaos that was going on while he was being evaluated. So we will, and I'll just give you that. That's what it looks like, the complexity of Berkowitz. And um, I am on a mission to get a nice, good copy of it. If not, I will piecemeal it and figure it out for you. And we could do a short just covering the article because I do find it interesting. There's a few pieces missing that I'd like to grab, but uh, until then, we will move on from that. All right. Notice how nicely David is able to express himself in his letter to D. He calls her beautiful, and I think his words try to make her feel special. And that's just something he couldn't do in person, but he was able to do it when he put pen to paper. So just a little note there. We're going to jump on to prison journals, and I am going a little bit out of order. Today, I'm going to start with the ending of one note and then the beginning of another. David Berkowitz writes, I am tormented. I cry in my cell. I miss my daddy. I hate myself. I am very uptight. I hear demons. I see demons. I need to talk to someone. I cannot be left alone. I will have a breakdown. I cannot be understood. I am truthful. I am doomed. You really tried for that insanity. You don't fool us. We know you're a nut job, but we all know the difference. We covered this. Okay, dated November 26. I know that I am not well hearing inner voices, having dogs talk to me, and being controlled by demons, yet I want to get better. If I ever get to a mental hospital, 
I want to cooperate with the doctors completely. I don't want to stay behind the walls forever. I owe my father a chance to receive hope. I owe society a chance to make myself good and repay them for all the troubles I caused as a result of my illness. Again, setting it off to the side, putting the blame somewhere else. Someday people will see a new David Berkowitz and the end of Son of Sam. Son of Sam can be dead forever if the courts, doctors, and me are willing to work together. I am. I owe my freedom to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I and the Father are one, says Jesus. So obviously this is while he's still hoping to have a chance at a mental facility, to be incarcerated in a mental facility. Uh, you know, it's so complex because I know I personally believe, and I think a lot of you do, that there's definitely a lot of mental illness going on there. But still, we come back to this guy that knew exactly what he was doing. He planned everything. He was so methodical. And, and yet, he was so messed up in the head. So it really is complex. But, you know, when you go and you make the decision to take lives and commit such heinous crimes, you know, you get what you get. Let's go on to one more. Dated 11-26-77. I have made myself a promise not to remain locked up behind bars forever. Glad you made that promise to yourself, Burke. I have a debt to pay to society and one day I will be free to repay it. I must repay society, and now that I am a Christian, I will work to help other people find true freedom and eternal life. In this hospital, I found Jesus Christ, and it is him who I am obligated to. I must tell society about the truth and hope. It's so crazy, too, and where he landed today, or, you know, for a long time now with the Son of Hope, is there a little shaded part in his mind that that reaches for this, that actually believes that he makes a difference? And I know that he has a huge following in the Christian community, and a lot of people really believe that he's been saved. But we've spoken about this in our discussions. You know, can someone like Berkowitz be saved? Share it in chat. What is, you know, I believe people can be saved, but when you're dealing with this level of complexity, if David Berkowitz, maybe if he was let out today, which I don't think will ever happen, you know, can he exist? I, I don't know if he could function as a normal human. Maybe if he stays behind the son of hope mask, um, but let's take it back and let's say he was not today that he's an old man, almost 70. Let's take it back. And if he was let out at maybe 40 or 50, how many people think that he would, it would only be a matter of time before the bubbling up happens and the mental illness hits and the demons in his head strike. I mean, I feel that had he been let out young, he would have done it again. Would he do it now? Maybe now he's too old. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. Remember, I'm just a small channel study group. I love to study. I love to read and I love to share to whoever wants to listen. But so I hope you're chatting it up. Um, what's your opinion on that? Imagine if he would have been let out. Remember, he's been incarcerated almost all his life. He was very dangerous in his young 20s and his teens too. Definitely in his 30s, 40s, he would have struck again, I feel. That's just my opinion, of course. 50s, maybe. 60s, maybe. He's a little old now. I don't know. I'm not saying he deserves any kind of pass. I'm just saying, let's think about this. It seems like he was already coming up with this story in his head that he was, you know, through Christ, he was going to save other people. Anyhow, we are going to move on from the prison journals. There are more, and I will share one or two here and there in our videos. Let me know if you're finding them interesting. What we can do is a short wrap-up 
um, not today of course, but a short video maybe that summarizes all of them at the end and then we could just have a discussion of what we may or may not have got from them. But I just thought it's interesting to put in there in the videos something to think about and something for us to chat about. So we are gonna move on. While I was fumbling through my John Deal police reports, I stumbled on this. It's not on the intro card, but that's okay. We're gonna jump back in time to December 8th, 1975 since we started with that, with the stabbings. It's a letter from David Berkowitz to Nathan Berkowitz, his adoptive dad. Dearest dad, be strong. Enjoy your life as best as you can. You have worked hard all your life to help your family survive. You have done very well and you should be proud. Now you deserve a rest. So please remain in good health for all your days. Take good care of Julia. Keep in touch with my sister and brother-in-law, Aunt Ben and Uncle Lou and Hal and Susan. Love, David. I always get so much out of his letters to his father because I believe that as much as someone like David Berkowitz can, I really do believe he had a respect and love for his dad. And as you heard earlier, when I was reading his prison journals, he writes, I miss my daddy. You know, an adult man or woman, and I do, I'm guilty of this all the time, that still refers to their parents as mommy and daddy. To me, it shows a deep felt warmth. I still, when I talk about my father, I call him my daddy. Um, anyhow, we'll move on from that. But you know, this is early December 75, so it's before the stabbing incidents. Is he starting to warn his dad that things are changing in his head or not so much changing, but maybe the fantasy, the dark fantasies in his head are starting to come out. They're starting to take over. Um, very, very touching. A uh, few videos back, I had read another letter while David was in the service writing to his dad, like begging him to just forget that he has a son. It was like somehow I feel like he was just putting a cushion out there to protect his father mentally. Like he knew, he knew like he knew that this darkness was coming and it was coming on hard and he would be doing some very vicious things. But I thought it was a short one. I thought I'd share that with you. And I will go back to digging for the police reports and we'll be right back with you. All right, I dug it up. Got to clean out this PC. I've got so much information between this and the Google Drives and all that stuff. So thank you for your patience. I really appreciate it. Now you can see on the screen, there are lots of redactions here. But we are going to take a look at a police report and the subject was info regarding love letter and affair on John Deal. So we all have heard rumors and speculations about an affair that John had. Um, I'm going to read what the police report has to say. And if you have any information, like I personally don't know the name or the person that he was having an affair with. Um, but let's get into the police report. And if you know anything other than what we talk about on the video, feel free to email me with the info if you'd like. Okay. So this report is dated January 30th, 1977, 15th homicide zone, homicide of Christine Freud, subject again, info regarding love letter and affair on John Deal. On 2277, the assigned, together with Sergeant Coffey, received permission from the deceased parents to look through her room for any evidence that may be helpful in this investigation. And then the redaction kind of goes right over that. So basically, law enforcement got permission 
from Freund's parents to go into her room and go through her things to see if they might not find some evidence that could link to why this horrific murder happened. So it looks like upon that uh, run through of the room, they found evidence. I'm sorry, it, it jumps back to was a love letter. So over here, it must have said something among the belongings or something of that nature uh, was a love letter sent by and it's redacted of, and that's probably either her address or where she worked to John Deal. A photocopy letter with a photograph of John Deal and Miss with her name redacted, which was sent by the deceased Christine to Miss redacted was also discovered. So she had this love letter, she had this picture, and it sounds like Christine sent a little package or approached Miss redacted with the information. Okay, was discovered. Another letter removed was a response to the first letter by Miss Redacted. So the side woman responded to the deceased, to Christine. The contents of those letters reveals the deceased's discovery of a love affair between Miss Redacted and John Deal and the deceased desire to expose this affair to Mrs. Redacted's husband, okay? So I'm gonna stop this just for a moment because I know that a while back I had put together uh, just a small snippet and mentioned it in one of the videos about John Deal mentioning that Christine had received crazy phone call a couple days prior. It sounds to me like, and a lot of people said, oh, that's related to the affair, and that's possible. But it sounds to me like this affair was exposed much earlier. So, and it, and it was also inferred that it was a man calling Christine. So, was it Miss Redacted's husband? Or could it have still been Berkowitz? Anyway, let's continue. On 2977, the officers interviewed it, redacted of redacted New York City deceased employer at, with the address redacted, as a result of Mr. Mr. Uh, maybe Deal's call to this office of information that he had relative to the deceased. Mr. Redacted says that he was aware of the above information because he was apprised by the deceased in October of 1976. It was his opinion that the letter was received by Miss Redacted without any knowledge by her husband and apparently the situation was resolved. So I don't know what words went down there, but... You know, maybe she said, I'm not going to see him anymore. I, I don't know. Uh, if you know, please share. On 2-10-1977, the assigned spoke to Mrs. Okay, so these might be friends of Christine's. I'm not 100% sure. On 2-10-77, the assigned spoke to Mrs. Redacted of Redacted. She says that the deceased had told her of the above information and to her knowledge, the situation was resolved. So they might be just checking in with some of her friends and like, yeah, she told me about that. I knew about the affair. It was resolved. Okay. On 215.77, the officers interviewed Redacted of Redacted, friend of the deceased. She also indicated that she was aware of this affair and the action that the deceased had taken when the when the first letter was found by the deceased. It was apparent to Miss Redacted that the deceased wanted to sever this relationship and wanted to reveal it to Miss Redacted, the one he was having the affair with, husband, to do so. As far as Miss Redacted, this is the friend they're talking about, was concerned, the situation was over. On 3277, John Deal was the subject of a polygraph test conducted at the police academy by Detective Fred Sanchez. 
the tests encompass the crime as well as Mr. Deal's affair with Miss Redacted. It is the opinion of Detective Sanchez that this subject was truthful and non-evasive in his answers. The assigned then questioned Mr. Deal regarding the love affair and he says that the situation was resolved a short while later after the letter to him from Miss Redacted was discovered by the deceased. On 3377, the officers interviewed Redacted of Redacted. Mrs. Redacted indicated that she is a close friend of Miss Redacted. So this is a friend of the lady he was having an affair with and is frequently in touch with her. Miss Redacted had told her that the affair was resolved even though she is still in love with Mr. Deal. Miss Redacted also says that her husband was told by her about her feelings for John, but his attitude was of forgiveness. Mrs. Redacted said that neither Miss Redacted, the, the side piece, or her husband has been back to this country since they had left in September of 76. So maybe he forgave her and they took off? I don't know. A, a check with the Department of Immigration and Naturalization, U.S. Government, by Sergeant Coffey was made, and according to Mr. Chrysalis, an agent of that department, indicated that there is no record of either Mr. or Mrs. Redacted that had entered this country since September of 1976, so it seems like they did take off Mr. and Mrs. Affair. And then this just solidifies the polygraph findings. Homicide of Christine Freud, subject polygraph testing of John Deal. On 2277, the assigned together with Sergeant Coffey were present at the police academy polygraph sec section with the subject John Deal. The test conducted by Detective Fred Sanchez, who geared the questions around the death of the deceased. It is the opinion of Detective Sanchez that the subject was truthful in all his answers and showed no indication of lying or evasiveness. So what I get out of this is, well, now we know that there was definitely an affair because I never had proof of that. So I always just thought it was hearsay. It probably happened, but had no proof of it. So now we know that the affair happened. But it sounds to me like when Christine found out about it, there was probably a big blow up, of course. And then things got patched up. John stopped seeing Mrs. Redact Miss Redacted. The husband and her took off. So I don't think that there was any connection here. I think it was just an, an unfortunate coincidence. And based on the results of the polygraph, John didn't wasn't showing deception. So I'm sure that the hardcore part of the polygraph was talking about the murder and then they put in the questions on the affair to see what they could get out of that and it didn't appear um there didn't appear to be deception on deal's part so i just think this is an unfortunate coincidence that's my opinion but i know that you are sharing your opinion in chat so what'd you think about that for me this is a first and i finally got some information and confirmation of this affair it's no longer an alleged affair it was an affair but you know people had said oh Christine's hit, uh, Christine's murder was a hit in relation to this affair. I don't think that's the case. That's only my opinion. Again, an unfortunate coincidence, but do tell me what you think. I wanted to share that with you because I shared it on YouTube and Facebook and people took interest in it. And so I figured I'd stick it here. So let me know what you thought. Interesting. All right, guys, well, let's do a little bit of a summary of what we covered. We talked a little bit on the Christmas Eve 1975 stabbings. We also covered another letter from David Berkowitz to D Channel, and we shared a little excerpt from the newspaper article explaining a little bit on who D was and why she might have had some access to Berkowitz shortly after his arrest. 
we read a letter from David Berkowitz to his father, Nathan. Talked about that a little bit. We went through two more of Berkowitz's prison journals, and we also covered the police report, which recently became available through the People versus David Berkowitz, and that police report covered the love letter and the affair regarding John Deal. And I thought it was telling. I'm glad that it included the polygraph results. So anyhow, I hope that you enjoyed your time with me tonight. Don't check off yet out of chat. I'm just gonna include a little clip from a military friend of Berkowitz and what he shared with the media during this chaotic time of the arrest. So thank you so much for joining. Don't leave, stay on if you feel like watching the clip, just a couple more minutes. I really appreciate you. I hope that you enjoyed our time together and I hope that you got something out of it. Please share in comments or via, if you prefer anonymity, send me an email on what you liked, what you didn't like, maybe what you hope to talk about in the future, anything at all. But let's sign off here and let's watch the clip together. Thank you so much. Saturday, August 13th, 1977. Berkowitz went from Jesus freak to recluse. Saginaw, the man held as the son of Sam killer in New York changed from a gregarious Jesus freak who bragged of past drug use to a recluse in less than a year, an old army buddy says. Paul Billow, 25, expressed shock and disbelief that his former barracks mate, David Berkowitz, 24, could have been the slayer who killed six persons and wounded seven more. You could never suspect that a person like that could do it, Billow said. I still can't believe it. Billow said he and Berkowitz served as clerks together at Fort Knox, Kentucky from September 1973 until June 1974 when Berkowitz left the... Billow said he and Berkowitz served as clerks together at Fort Knox, Kentucky from September 1973 until June 1974 when Berkowitz left the Army. They were members of the same 10-man barracks Unit of Company A, 8th Battalion, 4th Training Brigade. Billow, a bachelor who works as a guard at Saginaw Valley State College, returned to Saginaw two months after Berkowitz left the Army and has not heard from him since. Billow said, when I first met him in 1973, he was a Jesus freak, having renounced his adoptive parents' Judaism and having become a Baptist where he was outgoing and a source of laughs. He became sullen and reclusive. He didn't want to get involved in anything. His problem started long before that. He was in Korea for a year or so, and he used to tell us how heavily he was into dope. The drugs Berkowitz spoke of were reds, sedatives, and uppers, stimulants. His problem started long before that. He was in Korea for a year or so, and he said he used to tell us how heavily. His problem started long before that. He was in Korea for a year or so, and he used to tell us how heavily into dope he was. The drugs Berkowitz spoke of were reds, sedatives, and uppers, stimulants. LSD, the hallucinogen some reports have said, Berkowitz used, was not mentioned. It seemed like he had completely recovered from all that when I met him, though, Billow said. He was always friendly, always made a point to it to say hello or good morning. He hated noise. I was told he got moved from one barracks to ours because of the noise. He never dated or talked about family or friends from home, either. You know, if you, if you even for your role in it, um, had, had, how would you have felt if the death penalty was still around then, or was around then? Did you care at that point? There was a time when uh, I had given up hope. 
I was I feel so far under satanic power and satanic control that I didn't care. I was more like a robot than a person. There was a time in my life when I feel that I was just utterly under a a, a powerful influence that was destructive and, and I didn't care if I, it was a point where I didn't care if I lived or died. How did these people get such control over you? It, it was a process. It took uh, time. It was like little by little. I, I mean, I'm telling you, I didn't know it was going to come this way. I mean, when I got out of the service, I wanted to make a life for myself. My dad was moving to Florida. Most of my friends had it gets all gone or all changed directions in their life. And I, I just wanted to make a life for myself. I got an apartment. I had saved up and when I was in the service enough money to buy a used car to rent an apartment. I got a job as a security guard. I, I enrolled in Bronx Community College. I, I wanted to have a future, you know, and I, I don't know. Everything got turned upside down. I, I, it just, uh, I had good goals and uh, I just fell into some, under some kind of powerful influence. I mean, no, no. This is, this is a very valid issue. This we've talked about in the past. And this is that there was a great deal made of the fact that in uh, 19, around Mother's Day of 1975, mm -hmm. you finally found your natural mother. Yes. And there was one psychiatrist in particular who would later say that this is what put Berkowitz over the edge. Mm -hmm. He was so filled with rage because he had met his natural mother and she was a disappointment, et cetera, et cetera. Can you re would you respond to that? Yeah, I did um, find my natural mother. It was something that I just had in my heart to do. I had come across some literature from the Adoptees Liberty Movement, and uh, this was back in early 75 or, or somewhere around 74, and I just suddenly had this urge to go f see if I can possibly find my uh, natural parents because I was always curious. It was always like a driving thing. And to make a long story short, I did meet as you said, it was in 75. I even lost track of the time. I did meet my natural mother, and she turned out to be a very nice person. And we got along really good, typical Jewish mother. And I found out I had a half-sister, and we really kind of hit it off pretty good. Uh, I started to go over to their house all the time. I was out in uh, where my sister lived in Queens. Uh, she's long since moved away. Uh, my mom lived out in uh, Brooklyn just briefly and then moved to Long Island to Atlantic, uh, what's the Long Beach? And I was over at her house a number of times. We had a fine relationship, and she used to cook meals. And it was totally false that I had any rage or animosity towards her. Uh, that was, I feel that at that time with that uh, psychologist, he was mainly, and this is not a criticism, but look, you know, just looking back, it's, he was mainly interested in um, fitting me into these different molds that he already had you know as a Freudian psychologist he had these certain molds you have to go into it always reverts back to the childhood the mother a bad relationship but uh, that's was completely false which brings